many years ago, and I have a degree in economics from the university, and I never thought that Wall Street had anything to do with Economics 101 or the irrefutable law of supply and demand, until I started an option strategy department at Wheat First Securities, and the first person I hired brought, brought to me a book called The Three-Point Reversal Method of Point-and-Figure Stock Market Trading. As you look at this, at this cartoon, it says that we have a slight problem. The supply box is full, demand box is empty. And when I read this book, my life profoundly changed in a matter of one second. What this book did is the first paragraph of the introduction reads as follows, as follows. And if any of you have had the epiphany in your life, you'll know exactly what happened to me this moment. It says, the basic premise of point and figure charting and trading is the law of supply and demand. And nothing else governs the price of stock. When demand exceeds supply and the price of stock goes up, when supply exceeds demand, the price of the stock goes down. When supply and demand are contesting for supremacy, the price of the stock moves sideways. And I stopped for a moment there, and I said, oh my God, if there's a holy grail on Wall Street, I just found it. And having been a stockbroker at Merrill Lynch at this point in time for over five years, in which I had left and gone to Wheat First Securities to start the option strategy department there, this book was the first thing a guy brought to me that I hired, the first person in my option department that I hired gave me this book and he said, I'd like you to read this so you'll understand the operating system in my mind when I come to you about stock sectors in the market. And I said I would do that and I went to Virginia Beach that weekend with my wife and the epiphany happened when I read the introduction to this chapter. I still had, didn't even know what it was. But I knew I had to teach this to my brothers and sisters the rest of my life. He looked at the book as a way of trading your own account and doing well trading. I looked at the book of changing a whole industry. And that night is when I began exactly doing this. When I learned, I read this book, and I began to teach this methodology, and I have now for since 1978. The company got to the size where it attracted NASDAQ. NASDAQ bought the company in 2015, and it continues on. But this irrefutable law of supply and demand is exactly what caused me to gravitate to this immediately. I saw Wall Street for what it was in that one second. When I was a broker at Merrill Lynch, and this was back when you were called stockbrokers, not advisors, and not, not account executives or anything like that, you were a stockbroker, we got multitudes of research every single night from the home office, and it was from people who had been writing long, lengthy research reports. They had PhDs from Harvard, Yale, Stanford, the whole thing, and never had one iota effect on whether a price of a stock went up or down, and we had no idea why. Once I came across this book, it became clear to me exactly why. The clouds cleared on Wall Street. All of the obfuscation cleared. Because when you take down the funnel and you start jamming all this research into that funnel and you get down to the tip at the bottom, there's only one thing that matters and that's price change. I have never seen anyone who bought a stock that didn't hope the price went up. It made me think of what we do every single day. When you think about sector rotation, think about the supermarket. When you go to the supermarket, you don't buy winter squash in the summer or summer squash in the winter. You try not to buy, buy tomatoes in, in January. You buy them in, in July. They're less expensive. They last longer. They have a better shelf life. You don't buy watermelons in January. You buy them in August. And that's, that's produce. comes in and out of season. The same as sectors and stocks come in and out of season. And our supermarket is simply on the right-hand side here, which is an exchange. That's where all the things happen for us. And the sectors move in and out of season, no differently than they do in the supermarket. And it's the irrefutable law of supply and demand that causes that to happen. In fact, let me backtrack here for a moment. And here is the guy who made it all happen. Charles Dow was the very first person to begin recording stock price movement in the late, late 1800s. And he created a methodology called figuring. And that was taking a chart, basically a piece of chart paper, and writing the figures of the stock in. So if a stock rose from 30 to 35, he would write 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. And as a stock pulled back, he would shift columns and go down one box and begin reversing the order until a chart began to form. Well, it 
in, in the early 1900s, they changed that around to point and figure chart, which was made up of X's and O's. So instead of the stock rising in price and you would see the price of the stock, you now saw the X. And the X meant the stock is rising. And you saw the O, which meant the stock is declining. And it was the most concise methodology that I have ever seen that gives you a clear depiction of the irrefutable law of supply and demand. So when you look at this chart, and I want this to get in your mind because in a couple of seconds, we're going to get into something that you're going to want to, want to, want to, want to bring back. Um, the double top and double bottom are the, simplicity, simpli the most simplistic uh, uh, um, patterns that we look for in point and figure. A column of X's that exceeds the previous column of X's is simply a buy signal. So in other words, the stock rises to a point of, of former resistance where it fell back down. It now comes up to that same point of resistance and exceeds that level that would suggest the selling pressure has been dried up. The opposite is happening with the double bottom. The stock comes down to a level that formerly found buyers. This time it comes back and exceeds that level. That's what we call a sell signal. That's as far as we really go with point and figure charting. It doesn't, not much else happens. So as I move forward, you have two stocks, A and B. I want you to look at those two stocks. They're strong technically. They're strong fundamentally. They have everything going for them. However, one is likely to outperform the other. Which stock would you choose? If you're both looking at A and B now, which one would you look at and choose? How would you select that? The simple solution, comparison and contrast, the um, orange and the apple. How might we do this? Look at Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Two stocks, same industry sector, very similar to each. In fact, if I gave you the Pepsi challenge and blindfolded you and said, which one of these is Pepsi-Cola, you probably wouldn't know. I know each one of you would raise your hand right now and say, yeah, I, I could tell you which one was Pepsi and which one was Coke. You probably couldn't with a blindfold on. So how do I compare and contrast these two stocks? I do it by fourth grade arithmetic. If you have a nephew in the fourth grade or a son in the fourth grade, they can help you with this. This is basic division. Just call them in. If you put that division sign on the right-hand side there, you would put a dot on the top, a horizontal line, a dot on the bottom. And you would take one thing and divide it by another. So I can take a stock or an exchange trade of fund divided by an index. I can divide Malaysia by Indonesia. I can divide Coca-Cola by Pepsi. I can divide IBM by Spain. I can do anything I want to do in comparison and contrast. The same as we do with football teams on the weekend. When I look at Coke, Coke versus Pepsi, when I divide the two and I make that division, I'm going to come up with a number. So let's say Coca-Cola, I'm just going to pull this out of the air, say Coca-Cola was a 60 and Pepsi was a, was a 30. I divide the price of Pepsi into Coca-Cola, I get two on that division. Well, I can increase that by multiplying it times 10 or times 100 to make it a bigger number, to, easier to, to make it easier to plot. But the net result is I'm going to take that number on that division, now listen to this carefully, and then I'm going to plot it on a chart just like this. And it looks like a trend chart, but it's not. What this is, if you go back to that point and figure chart that we looked at in the beginning, the buy signals and sell signals, let's go back and look at that one more time. The column of X's that exceeds the previous column of X's is a buy signal. In the case of relative strength, it suggests that you own the numerator because we're, divi we're dividing something. We have a numerator and a denominator. And if it's on a sell signal on the right-hand side here, it suggests that you own the denominator. We're good to go now? Oh, major victory. Now I can give this back. All right. Now, like they would say in the old days, we're cooking with gas. So let's go forward here again. So when you look at this chart, it looks like a trend chart, but it's not. It's a chart that's developed by dividing the price of Coke by the price of Pepsi. Notice Coke on the left-hand side is the numerator. Pepsi on the right-hand side is the denominator. When you divide the two, it gets a number, and you plot it on the point and figure chart. So we said when a column of O's exceeds a previous column of O's, own the denominator. Well, that's the case with Pepsi. Pepsi has been the play here for many, many years. Since October, excuse me, December 7th, 2011, Pepsi-Cola has been the play. And you can see the difference in uh, performance there. Pepsi-Cola over Coca-Cola. You probably couldn't tell the difference uh, between them. But there you have it. We do this 
Back 30 years ago, we used to do this by hand, and we were able to do two of those a week. Excuse me, 200 of those a week by hand. It was the rite of passage at Dorsey Wright & Associates to do the relative strength charts by hand. So you look at those two charts and you say, okay, this told me that the Pepsi-Cola was the play, has been up 82.9% since the first sell signal suggesting you own the denominator. Coke is up 36%. You might think that was a good return, but when you have the opportunity to own Pepsi-Cola, that makes it different. Now today we do 13 million relative strain charts per night. We compare everything in the whole world. We follow every country in the world, uh, all part of our exchange trade of funds that we uh, run the indexes on, about $10 billion worth. If you said, let's go further and let's compare and contrast, and I understand how we did one-on-one. -on -one. We took fourth grade division, we, we used our nephew to help us, and we divided the uh, price of Coke by the price of Pepsi. How would I do this with the whole industry sector when there are 70 different items? Well, you would have to do 70 different items. Each one is going, to be, is going to be divided by every other one 70 times, and it comes out to a matrix just like this. Now, this matrix shows you which stocks are the strongest, which ones are the weakest, and if you look down from 1 to 19, you don't even see Coca-Cola or Pepsi. So Coke or Pepsi doesn't even make it into the top 20, but this is how we manage our exchange-traded funds. We're the first ones in the smart beta sector in exchange traded funds with our technical leaders group in which we, we go through 1,000 of the most prominent stocks in the United States and from that we cull it down to 100 stocks that we put into that exchange traded fund and we do it exactly this way. Fourth grade division through 1,000 stocks, we cull them down to the 100 strongest relative strength, just like this, no different. You could have your, your nephew or son do this by hand if he had enough time. And that's how we do it. Once every quarter, we, we readjust it. We run the whole thing again. We do all 1,000 of those stocks. We take the 100 strongest relative strength, and that becomes the technical leader's index. And it's had great performance. So that's how we end up with a matrix. So if I take this a step further here and say, well, let's look at Nordstrom. How would I compare Nordstrom to the, to the retail sector? Well, there's Nordstrom, J, JWN. We do the same division as we did before. The green suggests it's on a buy signal, so you would own the numerator, which would be Nordstrom. And that means you're owning Nordstrom through this period of time, uh, uh, 2000 and, uh, uh, excuse me, November 21st, 2003, through uh, October of 2007. And the returns are Nordstrom up 117, the retail sector up 35. Then you see the red happen, which is the column of O's that exceeds the previous column of O's, your basic sell signal. It's saying, now stop owning Nordstrom, own the whole sector. And you can see what happens there with the performance below. And for the sake of time, I have to move on further. Let's look at Starbucks versus the equal weighted S&P 500. In fact, most of you probably out there don't even realize there are two different S&P 500s that trade, uh, and one does outperform the other. So here you have Starbucks compared and contrasted against the equal weighted S&P 500. <coughs> and you can see the green suggests that you own Starbucks because that's on buy signals, column of X's, exceeding a previous column of X's. And you can see the return is 323% during that period versus 10% in uh, Standard Poor's equal weighted. Then you can see that it goes into a column of O's, exceeding a previous column sell signal, and during that period of time, Starbucks is down 67%. Equated S&P 500 is down 53%. So on a relative basis, you were better off in the S&P 500 equal weight. And then once again, Starbucks moves back into outperforming the broad averages, and you can see that happens on March 16th, 2009. Starbucks is up 896% versus the equated S&P 500. And you can see the cap-weighted S&P 500 is up 234%. So there's two S&P 500, same 500 stocks, trade totally differently. I'm sorry, I wasn't keeping the clicker up there. I was reading it from my iPad. The two most prominent fundamentalists, which would be Fama and French, Eugene Fama and Kenneth French, who are, I would say, the fathers of modern portfolio theory, that 90% of stockbrokers or advisors out there use. Um, the one thing that they say, the premier anomaly 
in investing is momentum. Stocks with low returns over the past year tend to have low returns for the next few months, and stocks with high past returns tend to have high future returns. In other words, things in motion have a tendency to stay in motion until acted upon by an opposite force. And that's exactly what happens with supply and demand. When a stock is controlled by demand, it will continue to rise in price until it's operated, uh, until its it, it is, uh, supply comes into it. Relative strength is a market forecast. It is not a market forecasting black box. It is not a statistic strategic indexing strategy. It's not reliant upon subjective inputs. And it's designed to target, is not designed to target exact tops or bottoms in security. Theodore Levitt, who was the head of marketing at, at uh, uh, Harvard University, once said, people don't want to buy the quarter-inch drill, they want the quarter-inch hole. And you'll find that's exactly what investors want. They don't want to get involved with the drill, they don't want to get involved in managing the portfolio. They want you to do it, but do it effectively. People have gotten to a point now where they're coming to their advisors saying, just buy me an index. Because most hedge funds can't even outperform the Standard Poor's 500. When you look at the statistics in it over the last 10 years, Rhode Island just, just, just shut down 13 billion head worth of hedge funds that were just underperforming for them. So people want the quarter inch hole, but they want it to, to perform well. They want their advisor to try to win the game. And I think I am out of time. There's all the disclosures. You don't need to, watch, you don't need to read those. Um, but thank you very much for having me here.